Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Deal. I'm the COO at uh, Selecta. And uh, I you know, appreciate everyone taking some time out of this Mother's Day to um, come and hear a little bit about some of the products and services that we offer. Can everyone hear me, I hope? I think it's you know. And before we get started with the main presentation, I'd uh, just like to take a few minutes to give you a little introduction to our company and, and the types of things that we do. We are, um, we were founded in 2006. We are uh, an enterprise just south of San Francisco, about half an hour south in Mountain View, California. Um, and the company's main focus really on, is on developing tools and uh, technology for uh, screening, genetic screening, uh, to identify the genes and genetic elements that are important for creating biology in, in whatever model systems um, you're interested in, in, in vivo, in vitro, et cetera to understand what are the uh, genes that are driving um, you know, uh, disease progression or uh, mechanism of action of a drug or resistance to a particular compound or differentiation, et cetera. And uh, we specifically focus on developing uh, parallel genetic assays where you can look at a lar large number of genetic targets at the same time, uh, you know, genome-wide and at that level so that you can um, help deconvolute what are the ones that are important for the process that you're looking at. And we're looking at developing assays that can be used in uh, laboratories, ordinary cell and molecular biology laboratories using uh, standard cell culture techniques, et cetera, and that don't require specialized equipment, uh, don't require large-scale automation, and uh, you know other large infrastructure. Uh, most of our assays, though, do require NGS. It's next generation sequencing as the readout. And we've been pretty successful with the approach. We have almost 500 publications now that have cited uh, technology that we've used. Some of these are collaborations. Some of them are just uh, researchers doing uh, research that have bought our products. And Selecta was actually um, started uh, with the functional screening um, using RNAi when we first uh, started the company in 2006. Uh, a couple of years after that, we launched the first pooled shRNA screening libraries. and. Uh, and then, of course, when CRISPR came along, um, that workflow is very similar, and so we were able to then work uh, also into the CRISPR functional analysis using the pooled screening libraries. And if you're uh, familiar with this technique, um, as many of you, I'm sure, are, um, it involves actually uh, synthesizing large pools of oligonucleotides that encode either sgRNA, or if you're making an shRNA library, shRNA. Uh, these uh, oligonucleotides are cloned into a viral system, a vector, uh, and then this uh, lentiviral vector can be packaged as lentiviral particles. Sometimes we also use retrovirus, it depends on what we're looking at. And then uh, these are introduced into a population of cells, and they're introduced at a ratio so that, um, you know, most of the cells just pick up one of the guides, one of the sgRNA, and it will knock out one target gene in the cell. And so across the population, then you have uh, a large number of different genes knocked out uh, in different cells. And then you can go and look and see um, how this affects the biology of the cells by uh, the most common assay is looking at viability, allowing the cells to grow for a period of time, isolating the genomic DNA and amplifying the sgRNA, and then sequencing them. And what you find is that some of the guides are underrepresented. Uh, and that would indicate then that they're toxic to the cells. And they're toxic presumably because they're knocking out a gene that's essential to the cells. So it's a way of identifying genes that are um, genetic vulnerabilities in cells, for example, if you're looking at cancer. Um, here's an example of this, um, looking at um, sensitivity to um, erlatinib, which is a, um, a, a drug to treat cancer. Uh, and what they did is develop a cell line that's somewhat um, resistant to erlotinib, and then they did a screen with a, um, a genetic library, a sgRNA library, um, genome-wide library, with five guides to each gene, uh, and then split that, and you have the uh, untreated and then the treated cells. And in this case, they were able to identify uh, sgRNA that dropped out of the population or were depleted, as I mentioned, which then are targeting uh, genes that make the cells more sensitive to the erlatinib, right? Um, because they're underrepresented in the, in the population after the screen. Um, they also uh, were able to identify genes that when they were knocked out made the cells more resistant. So then these genes are probably involved in the mechanism of action or involved in pathways that help the cells um, uh, be more sensitive to the or Latin. So, 
And then you can do similar types of screening with facts-based assays also, if you have a fluorescent marker, um, and look for cells, that, you know, genes that are important or pathways that are important for activating that uh, pathway. Um, at the moment, um, we have a number of off-shelf libraries for genome-wide screening. We also have um, the ability to make custom libraries uh, with more targeted sets of genes or for different organisms um, for specialized applications. We also have CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A libraries, if you're familiar with that. And the ability to make these uh, large-scale libraries with um, small oligonucleotides is not limited just to sgRNA or shRNA. We've made peptide libraries. And recently, we've also um, made a number of libraries where they just have uh, small sequences that are optimized for uh, Illumina NGS. Um, and these are, these are essentially barcodes that you can use then to introduce into a population of cells. And then you have each one of them essentially numbered or labeled with a different sequence. And so um, with these barcodes then, um, you can uh, introduce them, for example, in a population of cells that are then injected into a mouse um, as opposed to uh, plated. And then allow, you know, after a couple of weeks of growth, you have the tumor form and you have the, the cells on the plate. And you can see the difference in growth um, of these um, two different populations. Uh, and uh, the, the cells on the plate, for the most part, um, you have, you know, pretty good distribution. About 60% of the cells grow pretty well and uh, double uh, sort of together. But in the, uh, the mouse model, um, what happens is you get a very small number of cells, about 7% of the original cells that are injected, uh, eventually form 80 to 90% of the tumor. So it's a very skewed sort of growth. And um, you know, this is interesting if you're going to do an in vivo screen. It tells you how, many, uh, uh, how much virus you would need and how much you could feasibly screen in a, a mouse. Also just for cell tracking in general. And uh, this is an example from MD Anderson where they use this approach in a little bit more sophisticated way to um, label PDX cells and then passage them multiple times. And so they were able to make cell populations that had um, different, uh, uh, different barcodes. And so um, you know, with tens of thousands of different barcodes in the population, then they could go on and treat with different drugs and see how that affected the diversity of the population. Also, they were able to uh, do some uh, expression analysis um, of some of these samples, um, but they could see, you know, the changes here in the population and look at which barcodes and then try and go back to those cells. And that's even easier to do now because this particular library was only integrated into the genetic, uh, it was integrated in the, gene uh, the genome, but it wasn't expressed. Um, but we do have variations of the library now that are also expressed and so they can be detected on single cell type of technology. And so you can get the expression profile and also see what's going on. Um, with the cells that uh, survive or the cells that don't survive, go back and look at the uh, barcodes for those. And then uh, another platform that we've recently developed, or several years ago now, um, is uh, for uh, identifying which genes are active or inactive in, in um, various systems you're looking at. So this is an alternative to RNA sequencing. RNA sequencing is, is sort of you know, uh, a great approach, um, but it is a, a somewhat um, involved in order to set up that pipeline. Um, so what we've done here is sort of tried to take the advantages of QRT-PCR and apply that in a more broader uh, spectrum on a genome-wide way. And we did that by um, developing primers that amplify 80 to 200 nucleotides of the transcript of each um, human gene. And so what, what we have is, um, uh, you know, CD, synthesized cDNA, um, amplify a, the amplicon for the target gene, uh, and then add another two primers um, for a second PCR reaction, which add the P7 and P5 primers. And now you have a library that can be put directly on the Illumina sequencer. And what this allows you to do then is from total RNA, you don't have to isolate mRNA because it's targeted with the primers, um, be able to generate 19,000 um, amplicons that correlate to the expression level of all 19,000 genes in the human genome, uh, protein coding genes. And uh, this is very sensitive because it's PCR based. You can go down to single cell levels. Um, 19,000 is a lot for a PCR reaction, but for sequencing, it's actually a relatively simple library um, to, to sequence. It's um, much less complex than the fragmented entire transcriptome that you're sequencing with RNA-seq. And so uh, with 5 million reads, you're able to get deeper um, reads of the low expressed genes. Um, and then, uh, the analysis, and then this is the publication here, looking for um, markers in blood that um, are, uh, sorry, 
they're looking for markers in blood that help identify women that might have trouble during childbirth, um, it, during labor, um, you know, before they actually go into labor. And so what they did is they used three different approaches in order to uh, identify the um, potential markers uh, in blood, in uh, identify genes that are expressed in, in pregnant women versus control. And uh, they found that the driver map correlated better with QRTP, uh, QRT PCR results, which is the gold standard. And then also um, about three times more uh, reads were picked up with the driver map technique than with RNA-seq. And that was the previous data also I showed you. And the other thing is that the pipeline for this is actually much more straightforward than RNA-seq because what you're doing is you have the amplicons and you just need to align the sequencing data to that. And so uh, rather than having to um, work out um, all the fragments of sequencing and try and piece together the entire gene, um, with this it's much more straightforward. You can do this really on a spreadsheet in terms of the alignment and analysis. We've recently taken that same approach with the PCR um, using um, a multiplex PCR. And maybe the one very important thing I did mention is that it's a multiplex PCR reaction. So it's not just individual PCRs amplifying each of those genes. It's 19,000 um, reactions in a single tube. So there's 38,000 primers in a single tube for the expression profile. So it's essentially doing the work of just one RT-PCR. And in the case of the um, adaptive immune response here, looking at T-cell uh, receptor profiling and B-cell receptor profiling, we've also done this sort of multiplex PCR approach where we uh, develop primers that amplify the variable region, and also um, we have primers that amplify the full-length um, uh, transcript for the T-cell receptor and B-cell receptor. And you're able then to, in a single reaction, amplify all of the um, B cell and T cell, if you want to do both, uh, receptors in one reaction and then sequence those. Um, we have both RNA and DNA. And um, my colleague, Dr. Alex Chenchek, is going to talk a lot more about uh, the details of this system. So thank you.